just over the fence, or in this case, just across the cornfield in Iowa, a different kind of seed is growing. North American manufacturing is coming back, and you may not even realize it's there. Turn off the highway, make a left at the stop sign, and you'll find yourself in an idyllic Midwestern town. Behind these unassuming doors, something special is happening. Entrepreneurs are tired of waiting for corporate America to bring manufacturing home, so they're taking matters into their own hands. Welcome to ZP Machining, where Chris has been quietly building his machining empire, one machine at a time. Now, what does ZP stand for? Uh, Zeitz Precision Machining. Always did machining through high school and did gunsmithing school, and then bought a couple of lathes in the mill and did it as a hobby for a while, and grew so big, I just kind of had to start a business on it. So, so now you're full-time 24-7? Yep. Well, can let's, we take a peek? Yeah, let's go. So this is actually a fully set up shop and this isn't even your whole garage. You still no. actually have a garage. Yeah. Yep. Tell me a little bit about the space. Uh, Basically moved in after we had our first daughter so I could work from home more and work at night more and just grew from there. First machines I had were that lathe, that mill, and a couple of bridge ports. This is an old Atlas lathe I got from an old gunsmith uh, from Minnesota. Uh, turned a lot of barrels on it and made a lot of parts on it. So is that kind of where you started? It was really kind of the more gunsmithing. You were doing stuff for yourself and then kind yep. of did it for other people or? Yep, uh, actually started, I bought three blanks. Uh, figured I could keep the best shooting one and sell the other two and break even. Uh, and they sold right away. So I took that money, bought more blanks and just kept doing that. And here we are. I've always been machining uh, through high school. Did the first year tool and die at a community college, gunsmithing school. Don't run this one much anymore? Yep, I do a lot of deburring and polishing on it mostly. Yeah, but hey, so. listen, I have a lot of tooling like this where that oh, time yeah. you need it, yep. you really need it. Exactly. Do you have three phase in here now? No. You do some pretty long stuff on this as well. I mean, yep. I guess, like you said, gunsmithing, you're doing yep. long barrels and yep. stuff like that on there. Most barrels will be, longest will be about 30 inches. This is an old smithy. Uh, I bought two lathes in this mill from an old gunsmith and it works. It doesn't take up much space. It does what I want and actually holds pretty good tolerances. If you had to kind of give a idea of your customer base today, what kind of industries are you serving? Uh, a lot of agriculture. Uh, we've done some automotive, some communication stuff. Just a lot of prototype works. When did you take the jump? You know, how busy did you have to get before you were like, all right, this is my full-time gig? Pretty much I started making powder funnels uh, and it just basically blew up, or took off. So that's when I got the first 8L eighth and that really started doing job shop work after that. These are your own products that you're selling, right? Yes, a little bit of word of mouth, but hey. most of it's online. This is just our workbench here. Uh, got plenty of storage for tooling, uh, surface plate for checking a few things. A um, couple of rifles I built. Built the stocks from hand, uh, turn the barrels down, chamber, uh, thread them, cut the crown, uh, and I actually hand lap my own barrels. Too, how, so. how do you lap a barrel? I'm not too familiar. Uh, basically you take a long cleaning rod, uh, you'll melt a lead lap on it, push it through, put your lapping compound on, and it's all by feel. Oh. Actually with rim fires, you want to taper lap them. So you'll have about two to three tenths of, of choke in the barrel. So that way with the lead slug, it, it chokes it down. Got it. Down. Just How do you measure that? Feel. <laughs> feel. Because <Yep. laughs> when you push, if you push a slug through the end and stop just before the muzzle, push it back, you can feel it let go as it comes back. When, you, when you're doing a run of something, are you doing one, or are you doing five, are you doing a uh, hundred? Kind of, what is an average job look like? I'd say anywhere from, average is probably around 50 parts. 50 We've parts? done up to a thousand parts. Uh, 
Tormach 8L. Uh, this one's set up to thread a barrel. Uh, we made the chuck itself. Oh, so, really? Yep. Essentially, so you could center it properly. I'm yep. guessing it's almost like a four jaw, but inverted. Yep. And on this end, we got so we can adjust it so we get that that barrel perfectly true. Oh, and you got so it's almost like a gang style tooling on yep. this. Yep, that's uh, the first generation gang tooling we made. Uh, I got an updated one on the second one. So. And you, what are you programming this? And are you using Fusion? Everything's conversational. Oh, just straight conversational. Yep. So this, oh, this is your actual controller for it. No, you. You got your ODs, ID, profile, face chamfers, groove, drill and tap and thread. So it's literally 100% conversational. You yep. say, I want to drill this. Yep. You follow the prompts and away you go. When did you kind of decide, listen, I'm tired of doing this on manual stuff? Yep. It started with the powder funnels. Uh, it was taking me about 45 minutes to do it on the manual, where on the 8L it takes about five minutes for both hops. Big thing was price. Uh, There's a lot of information out on them. I mean, basically learned how to run them off of YouTube. This is set up to turn a half by 28 threads. Let's start it. Yeah. I'm gonna close the door. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise we're both gonna wear it. Yep. Kids like to come out and watch it. Oh, of course. <laughs> oh, that's a sweet little unit. Yep. Is that actually doing the threading right now? Nope. Uh, facing, then we're going to do OD. Oh, I see. Cut chamfers, then bore the ID for the crown, then thread is last. And I take it when you're doing barrel stuff like this, rigidity in your tooling stuff oh, yes. is... yes. It shows. Do Barrels, it. threading, I would probably do 50, 60 barrels oh, a year. Oh, wow. Yeah, you're not seeing any chatter, no nothing on no, that. No, it's pretty rigid. Like I say, that game quite really, really helps stiffen everything up. And that one we have set up with a pneumatic collar closer. And then I got a uh, solenoid on it too. Now, is that something that it came with or is that something uh, no, you added later? that's, uh, I had to add that on. You were saying this is a second generation yep. tooling on here? Uh, I set it up with the grooves so that way I can set that gang plate for that specific part and save that offset. Oh, so that's something you actually put on there? Yeah, I made that, yep. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I know what you're saying. So you're like position one. Exactly. You know where that offset is. It's almost like a little Swiss kind of. Kind of. Yeah. Yep. Poor man's Swiss. Oh, yeah. Hey, it works. <laughs> and what's that on the end there? Is that uh, a bar polar? Polar. Oh, that's a bar puller. Yep. So as you run it, you can literally have that come. That's what we're making there. What are those? Uh, it's a loaded chamber indicator for a CZ. Oh. It sticks out the back end of the bolt. When it's cocked, it'll stick out and it shows that it's loaded. What is that stainless? Yep, that's 17.4. 17.4 pH? Yep. That's why the finish looks so nice too. Yep. <laughs> and how many of these would you be doing in a run? These are like uh, 50, 100? Yeah, usually 30 to 50. And this is a product you're selling yourself? Yes, yep. Beautiful. How many of these would you do a year roughly? I'd say two to 300 a year. Really? So, that's good business. Yep. You know, I, I love seeing these businesses like this where you have an interest. I mean, clearly you're a firearms guy who likes it. You yeah. like gunsmithing. So you find your own niche in it with something you like, and then make a lot of parts for that niche. You exactly. already know the market, you know what people need. And this one actually yeah. has its own- Console, yeah. What's the difference between this one and this? Is this just an option that was with it? Yes, or? yep, that's an up updated option or upgrade. And it would program pretty much the same way yep. I take yep. it, right? Yep, as far as the path pilot, it's identical. I'll always keep one without the collet closer just to dial barrels in. Mm -hmm. You know, once you add that pneumatic collet closer, you can't do that. Right. It's just too far. Uh, and the nice thing with the 8Ls is they're so short between the headstock, you can do shorter barrels too. Oh, or yeah. Like on your manual lathe, if you want to do a 16 inch barrel, you can't dial that back in hardly. Right. No, that makes sense. So you got to work around it. And what kind of drove you towards this kind of setup for your shop? You know, a lot of turning, I guess, a lot of it is just yep. based on the work you have, but 
you know, you got the one and got your second. Why did you stick with it? Uh, big thing is space. Uh, I've been super happy with them. Uh, they hold great tolerances. Uh, I haven't had any issues with them. Oh, you got a blasting cabin over here too. Yeah, that's one I made. Oh, you made this one? Yep. <laughs> what a beauty. Do you use this much? A little bit when we do sear coating. Oh, you do Cerakote? Yep. Do you do that here as well? Yeah. I thought that was That's a super involved, oh. The heat treat oven for it. You are a guy who likes to do <laughs> stuff himself. Now, when it comes to starting your own business, because obviously you had to start somewhere, there's a lot of people out there that would love to be doing what you're doing here. What are yeah. some tips or things you learned along the way that might be able to help them? I'd say just dive in and do it. Really? And learn on the way. Uh, that's what works best for me at least. Hop in with two feet? Yep. Were there any like challenges that you had to overcome that you couldn't get your head around, but um, all of a sudden it was like, ah, here we go. I'd say the biggest thing was starting in the CNC, not really knowing what anything was, or right. how to really set up. So learning like the GNM code and, and getting into that side of it was kind of a challenge at first. But was that helpful because you had the conversational that way? It was, yep. But now I'm going through and hand it if I have to. Just to kind of fine tune your program, exactly. make it a little bit easier yep. for what you want it to do. Yeah. And what? Are, where are you going from here? I mean, obviously this has grown from some manual machines yeah. to one CNC to two CNCs. Yep. What's next for you? Uh, I'd say next probably get a bigger lathe again and just so that way I can do chamber more and, yep. and just keep building up. Um, and at some point you're gonna start hiring people? Uh, Probably eventually. Oh yeah, that's, is <laughs> I mean, that kind of, are you more a solo guy or you know, is the goal like, hey listen, I want three guys working uh, with me? I'd say if the workload is there, you know, if you gotta hire a guy, hire a guy. And you still so, got a whole second side of your garage yeah, you right? can go through here. You got room. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and if people want to find out more about ZP Precision, where can they go? Uh, Sorry, ZP Machining, where can they go? You can go on Instagram at ZP Machining. Uh, we have a website at ZP Machining and Facebook is well.